Hey, 80s Nation, just a quick message about the 80s cruise. As you know, each year Brad and I set forth on a week-long cruise to host trivia sessions, listen to live concerts, record podcasts, and dress like 80s nerds for a whole week. And we love it, especially the fact that we get to dress like we normally do. That's true. But we want you to come along with us in 2019. Performers include Kenny Loggins, OMD, D. Snyder, Berlin, The Fix, English Beat, Sheila E., and more. And this year, there are some cool new additions to the cruise. For starters, another co-host is coming with us. Hi, everyone. It's Jen with one N. I'm already packing my bags. And the cruise has added a horror movie theme night and a special prom night. Yeah, we always have proms on the A's cruise, and they're great. But for this year, it's an extra special one. It's themed to Back to the Future and the, uh, you know, fish under the sea dance. Uh, Stephen, it's the enchantment under the sea dance, (sighs) probably because actress Claudia Wells will be joining us. And we want you there, too. Just go to www.the80scruise.com and book. But remember to use the special promo code STUCK to save hundreds off advertised rates. And stay tuned. There's more news coming soon on other new theme nights that you're going to love. What? No hints? Uh, let's just say I don't want to fly into that danger zone or bet $100 that you're going to slice into the woods. Just remember the promo code STUCK. You'll save money and you'll let other cruise people know you are a member of 80s Nation. Now on with the show. Travel back in time to the 80s, reliving the shenanigans. It was the early 80s, and sex was still a good way to meet new people. The disappointment. That's a real shame when folks be throwing away a perfectly good white boy like that. And the self-confidence. I'm six foot, three inches tall, and maintain a very consistent panda bear shape. Because just like you, we're stuck in the 80s. Sure, it's not 1985 right now, but who knows what tomorrow will bring. Symmetrical book stacking, just like the Philadelphia Mass Turbulence of 1947. You're right, no human being would stack books like this. Hey, hey, welcome to Stuck in the 80s. It's your host, Steve Spears. And Brad in L.A. And today we give the music and movies a rest and pick up some books to give you our picks for an 80s-inspired summer reading list. I bet you like to read a lot, too. Print is dead. Don't forget, Stuck in the 80s is a member of the CLNS Podcast Network. You can find our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and the CLNS Media mobile app. Don't forget to listen to our podcast at the CLNS Media website. You can find it at clnsmedia.com. And as always, we plead, we beg, we would bribe you if we had any money. Please, if you love our show, share the link on social media. It's funny I even mentioned this because just before we began today's show, I noticed an old friend from high school named Kelly shared the link to the latest show that we did on movies and music of summer. Way to go, Countryside Cougars, class of 85. Let's all be 80s nerds together in 2018. Steve, joining us today to help us sound out the big words, we need twice as much help as usual. It's Jen with one N <laughs> and Gail in DC. Hello. Hi, guys. Oh, my gosh. It's been a long time since we've had you on the show, Gail. I'm so happy to be back. Well, naturally, you're the person who has to be on a, a summer reading show. You write the very excellent must-read blog, everydayiwritethebookblog.com. Thank you. I have don't know how I could think of anything better than the combination of 80s and books in one podcast. 80s books. I've been known to read occasionally. Reading is fundamental. I I don't read as much as I should, really. When we started pulling out books for this, I'm like, oh, I read this. Wait, I read that last year. Oh, I read that. Oh, I read that two years ago. Oh, uh, I need to step up my game. So I'm hoping to pick up some hot tips from you all today. Your book on how to pick up trashy women came today. Tell me something. What's a little boy like you doing with big boy smut like this? Excellent. So here's how it's going to go. We're all going to have uh, at least one pick that we're going to tell you about real shortly. We all would probably recommend these books. We've all at least read most of these books. I'm, I'm still making my way through mine. After that, we're going to mention some of the picks that the listeners suggested over the last couple of weeks. And uh, to top it all off at the very end of the show, Jen says she has an excellent new round of uh, the trivia game. Mm-hmm. Any, any, I'm excited to, to try any, it out any, you guys. any hint on what the theme might be? Is it a book-related challenge? You'll have to listen at the end. You'll have to wait. Uh, You'll see. It's good. It's fun. Hey, uh, no spoilers? 
Zero spoilers. <laughs> hey, before we dive into our book picks, let's take a short time out to talk about something that's also kind of a touchy subject around here. Getting old. Stuck in the 80s is proud to tell you about a new partner called Hims. It's a one-stop shop for hair loss, skin care, and sexual wellness for men. If you're like most guys, you hate going to the doctor. Hey, as, as much as I rave about my last couple of visits to the doctor, I rescheduled that sucker three times because I absolutely hate going to a doctor's office. And that's where 4 comes in. You go to the website any time of the day. You answer a few quick questions about your hair issue, your, your skin issues, your issues in bed. A doctor reviews your answers and prescribes the right medication or products for your challenges. Products are shipped directly to your door. Trust me, I'm 50 years old. If you don't think I have issues I need help with, you're clearly not paying attention to this podcast. <laughs> so do yourself a favor. Try out 4 Actually, the address is F-O-R-H-I-M-S dot com slash 80s. Right now, Stuck in the East listeners get a free trial month of hymns for just $5. You'll be saving yourself hundreds of dollars, plus all that time spent in the doctor's office and pharmacies. That's F-O-R-H-I-M-S dot com slash 80s. Okay, now that all of our male listeners have put the podcast on pause to head online to that website, are you guys ready to talk some books? Let's do it. I've been waiting to do this episode for like two years. <laughs> Gail, you are the, uh, you're the you're the book expert. We defer to you and you shall go first. What's your pick? Oh, well, thank you. Okay, so I did a rare foray into nonfiction for my pick. I, I had a really hard time picking which one I was going to do, but I think if you can be in love with a book, I am in love with this book. It is called Mad World, an oral history of new wave artists and songs that defined the 1980s. This book is by Lori Majewski and Jonathan Bernstein. And I am a massive new wave fan. Like if I look back on all the music I love from the 80s and the music I still listen to now, it's new wave. I listen to first wave on uh, Sirius XM. This is like my go-to music. So this book for me is just a dream. What the authors have done here is they've taken about 30 artists from the 80s that are new wave artists. And with each one, they go through and they have a bunch of different little sections in a chapter. So one nice thing about this book is you don't have to read the whole thing in one sitting. You can just pick yeah. it up and read a chapter here, a chapter there. And then in each chapter, they first give a little background and context on the band. So they set it in like historical context and what part of the new wave movement did this band yeah, emerge I love from. how they each kind of take a moment at the beginning of each chapter and say, you know, this is how I experienced it. Yeah. So it's written by a man and a woman. They're both entertainment, music, 80s journalists who have written about this and edited magazines. They're very knowledgeable. And they each talk about, yeah, what's their perspective on this music? What does it make me think of? You know, my own sort of personal connection to it. And then they interview the artists themselves. So they'll talk about the artist. They'll talk about what that artist was thinking during the time, what they think about it. Oh, and the other thing, too, is for each artist, they pick one song that they want to focus on. It's not necessarily the most famous song. It's just that the song that they feel like they, you know, is most representative of this band for them yeah. or has some, you know, standout meaning to them. So they get the artist to talk about that song, put the song into context. They talk about what is the artist doing now. So you see, like that was then, this is now, then they even make a little mixtape for you. And they say, okay, if you want more, here, I'm just flipping through it right now. Like if you want more, five more songs by bands of weirdos. This is a, <laughs> this came out of, oh, sorry. I Brad, know exactly where that's came out from. Of the Devo yes, chapter. the Devo chapter. That's so funny. That was completely random. And I mean uh -huh. that honestly. So five no, more songs by Gail bands of weirdos. And they give you a... Thanks for joining us today, Gail. <laughs> we'll see you in 2027. Well, I think you would acknowledge that they're weird. I, I don't think that affects No, it you. doesn't. So then you can make like your own little Spotify playlist, you know, to for each one of these songs. But I just adore this book. I think it's the greatest thing. And the only thing that would make it better for me is if, well, two things. One, if it had the English beat in it. But secondly is if I could actually listen to this on audio, if they could intersperse this with live interviews and live clips, I think this would be fantastic. Like basically yeah. take this book and turn it into a podcast is mm. what I would like. That would be amazing. This is a great pick, um, Gail. Really, really oh, good. And I, I had the great, yeah, no, I had the good fortune of reading this book when David Bowie passed away. And I say that because as I was reading it, almost everyone says we right. all wanted to be Bowie. Yeah. That's it. Yep. And, and I didn't realize until I read this book 
how deeply yeah. that ran with so many of these. So, uh, Gail, can I ask you a question? Yes, of course. Did you skip around to your favorite bands first, or did you read it cover to cover? <laughs> skipped around for sure. You skipped around, yeah, because I'm like, yeah. wait, I, tears for fears. It's, I got to totally read that right now. That. It's totally right, built yeah. for exactly. that. Yeah. 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 And like, actually, I just keep this well next to the other 200 books that are sitting next to my bed. This is like the the curse of being a book blogger is like, I have just hundreds and hundreds of unread books in my house. And many of them are stacked in weird, like precarious little piles on my night table. But this book is always there because I like to just kind of pick it up and flip through it. And it's, you know, it's really almost more of like a reference book than it is. It's certainly not a novel and it's not even, you know, got yeah. a linear a story to it or even a even a nonfiction linear story but it's just it's so well done and there's great pictures in here and yeah i just so highly i'd love to see it. them do another volume that was other genres yeah. because i i agree with you this is this is like core 80s music for me but this is what i always say to steve like the interviews that i like the best on stuck in the 80s are people whose music i didn't listen to and people i don't know anything about it, like that's right. where i that's where i have the most <laughs> upside but available. I, I would argue that so. Lori majewski who by the way also is on um, first wave a lot with her lust for lists playlists mm-hmm. which are amazing I, I would argue that her that's her forte is is new wave i don't know that i would want to hear she's a fantastic journalist i'm sure she would do an excellent job interviewing other genres of music, but I don't know that she would be able to make that personal connection that she does in this book. Uh, could be. Yeah. I was going to say that's too, Steve. I think that she brings such passion to new wave. I don't know how it would be if she was looking at like hair metal <laughs> or I don't know what else. Yeah. You can tell they're fans and that, that makes it fun if you're a fan yeah. to like yeah. follow along with two other fans. Well, Hey, let me go second. I have a book that is very much like Gail's book. In fact, the way I had picked it up and read it, I skip around on the chapters. I don't necessarily go in order. And that is um, a book by the the DJ Richard Blade. It just came out last year and it's called World in My Eyes. It is basically an autobiography by Richard Blade. If you don't know who Richard Blade is, that's okay. I'm going to fill you in right now. Brad knows. Because <laughs> uh, Brad's been in, uh, in California a long one. time. He, he knows who Richard Blade is. Richard was one of the f- radio DJs at K-Rock out in Southern California during the station's glory days in the 80s. Uh, and that station, I think we would all have to agree, was where new wave bands had their U.S. career made or not made in those days. Certainly didn't hurt. It didn't hurt at all. These days, probably most people know yeah. Blade. He's one of the DJs now in Sirius XM's first wave. You hear he's in the afternoon here out, out east. And um, as Brad would, would probably phrase a little bit more harshly, he's not shy about talking up his personal connections that he has with so many of the bands that he plays on the radio. I hear he had lunch with Depeche Mode again. <laughs> yeah. so, Enough already, Blade. I know. We get it. You eat lunch every day. So his book, World in My Eyes, which is based, of course, on the name of a uh, Depeche Mode song, uh, you get all the stories behind all his friendships that he's made in the business, be it with um, Duran Duran, the Smiths, Berlin, or obviously his personal favorite, Depeche Mode. If you also want to go back, Richard was a guest on Stuck in the 80s. It was episode 417 back in the fall of 2017. So just a few months ago, I talked to him for about for about an hour. Uh, really super nice guy. Anyway, the book covers his life from a youngster growing up in England all the way up to today. But um, when I first opened it, I had heard that he had a relationship with Terry Nunn from Berlin. But I didn't really know, like, you know, how did it go? How did it end? Are they still friends? Because I gather that they're still friends because they talk about each other. But I was just kind of curious. And so there's one chapter. I think there's two chapters, really, that are kind of devoted to his relationship with Terry Nunn. And I'm telling you, if you get this book, you it, you will be hard-pressed not to turn to these chapters first. He is very, very blunt about how much he, he loved her and how 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 much she turned him on and how much he completely screwed her over by, oh, no. by being like by just like not being faithful and just really humiliating her a couple of times. Mm. I was reading the chapters as I was flying out to that um 80s in the sand thing down in the Dominican Republic where, where Richard was and where Terry was. And I so badly wanted to get a photo of them together and I never did see them together. I never did get them to sign my book either, but um, <laughs> it, start there and then skip around your chapters, t- you know, read his stories about Depeche Mode, but don't skip the early years. Cause it's, he's, 
he's kind of a funny lad. It's kind of interesting where he got his inspiration and his sense of humor. It's very revealing stuff. I mean, there's he doesn't hold anything back. I'm surprised that his wife still lets him live in the same house after after this came out. <laughs> but, uh, Does he talk at all about leaving K Rock and going yeah. to like open a dive shop someplace? He talks about everything, and it just and, and some yeah. of the stories about how he was on these competing uh, music video programs of the day and how badly they went for him, you know, and, and how much it cost him financially. It's just. Huh. There's a lot of heartbreak in this. I remember that show. I can't remember what it was called, but I remember yeah, watching like video it. One in syndication like in Oklahoma. Yeah, it was yeah, it was video one. I think that's right. One. Yeah, it happens right about the time of the whole Terry Nunn thing. It's just, it's like, boy, you know, it's they just it's some guys. I mean, you can't say this is not a lucky guy. He's had a great life, but man, he's taken some lumps along the way, and and he's not afraid to talk about them all. So. There you go. World in my eyes. Steve, what's the picture situation? Or does he have a lot of pictures of himself with Depeche Mode eating lunch or other? <laughs> no, I didn't, I didn't really. I didn't, <laughs> yeah. I honest to God haven't really. You know, when I open up autobiographies and biographies, I, I normally go to the pictures first and start looking through them. I know. Me too. <laughs> um, he's got them in there. But to be honest, I was so captured by what he was saying. That it was one of the first times where the words meant more to me than the pictures did. But they're in there. Huh. Um, and also, I hear that an audio version of the book is coming soon. And I think I, – I, I may have heard this wrong. I, tr- I tried to confirm it today. But I think he's getting some of the people who the chapters are about to actually read their chapters. Huh. But I'm not sure. Well, I don't want to say something I wanted to hmm. hear his voice for three hours. <laughs> me now. <laughs> I don't want to hear our voice for three hours. What, well, that's what editing is for. Hear- I want to hear Jen's voice now. Jen, what do you got for your uh, summer reading list? Well, true to form, I was going to say something else, <laughs> but I switched I'll, and I'll explain why. So originally I was going to talk about a book called Back to Our Future, How the 1980s Explain the World We Live in Now, Our Culture, Our Politics, Our Everything by David Sirota. That's just the <laughs> title. That's not the entirety of the book. <laughs> but but it's a great it's a really it's a really great book it, it puts some cultural th- things into historical context this is where i think i shared this in an earlier podcast about how um top gun was financed by the military us military so i was l- excited about that and then i went l- to look for it to refresh my memory and i couldn't find it and then i realized i gave <laughs> it to my best friend lucy so i went to amazon and i went to order it again and then I came across this other book that I had never heard of before. And I was like, eh, okay, sure. I mean, you know, I, I, you see these 80s books all the time. And sometimes they're great. Sometimes they're terrible. And I thought I'd give it a shot. So this book is called Life Moves Pretty Fast, The Lessons We Learned from 80s Movies and Why We Don't Learn Them from Movies Anymore. <laughs> And that is just well, the you title. Know, all that's these not titles are really long. <laughs> these these nonfiction eighties books are so long. <laughs> but anyway, it, it's uh, it's written by a journalist named Hadley Freeman, and I was a little reluctant at first because um, she's a uh, culture and entertainment writer for like Vogue and different publications, but she's also been writing hmm. for the Guardian in London for years. So I was a little nervous that it was like, you know, from the perspective of uh, like a UK perspective and I may not be able to relate. And then it turns out she's from New York. So she's just living in London. And except for things like, you know, she mentions Michael Douglas's braces instead of his suspenders in Wall Street. <laughs> you know, and at well, one they point are braces. She- Technically those the braces button into the pants, suspenders clip on. Wow. So those are braces. Okay, so how about this? Melanie Griffiths Reeboks in Working Girl, she calls them trainers. You got me there. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> but um but yeah, so she's wonderful. She is great. And and you know, we're talking a lot about music tonight and so many of the memoirs and stuff are are musicians and are fun, but this is actually an 80s movie book I can get behind because there are a few that are not great. This one is fun because she talks about each chapter is a different movie, but she doesn't just talk about that movie. She talks about it in in a, in a context, uh, some kind of social context. So the easiest way for me to describe this is to to read a couple of the titles and then the subheads. So, Gail, you would love this book. The very first chapter is Dirty Dancing. Mm-hmm. And the subhead is Abortions Happen and That's Just Fine. <laughs> oh, <that's> good. <laughs> yeah, but... Oh, wow. but but what's so interesting is so she talks about um, sort of how in the 80s there were storylines, there were plot lines with abortion, right? Like, for example, Fast Times at Ridgemont High is one, um, Last mm-hmm. American Virgin is one. And it wasn't like scandalous, but she compares it to movies today and how because of, you know, more conservative thinking or whatnot, it, it becomes a, an issue or it's never spoken of. 
So it's just interesting the way she sort of looks at these old movies that I, I, I love. And I have had a new appreciation for them reading this book because it's like, for example, um, oh, here we go. Pretty in pink. Awkward girls should never have makeovers. And she talks about how in the 80s, girls like didn't dress that great in movies. I mean, look at Andy's prom dress, right? <laughs> but she compares it to sort of teenage movies now and how they're like easily 20 pounds lighter and how mm-hmm. they all are so they, they dress a lot sexier than, you know, your average Mary Stuart Masterson or even Leah Thompson, you know? Um, so anyways, it's really, it's fascinating. And she even talks about, um, some class issues. So she talks about, uh, Ferris Bueller's day off and how John Hughes sort of, you know, a, a lot of ways played with the, these ideas of class, right. And, and kind of helped to cement that eighties idea of like, if you're rich, you're a jerk. If you're poor, you're cool and funky, you know, and, and mm. admirable somehow. Um, so I don't know. So it's a fascinating book. She makes this, she makes a lot of, um, she has a lot of insights in them, which I think are great. One in that Ferris Bueller chapter is that Ferris is just Ducky Dale with money. Huh. And I was like, holy Mm. shit. Uh, Sorry. (laughs) I was like, oh my God, she's right. She's right. So I highly recommend this book. Um, like I said, it doesn't just talk about the single movie. It talks about, you know, sort of other movies in that, in that bucket. And sometimes not. There's a chapter about Ghostbusters, uh, which is basically like how she learned as a kid what a real man was. And they were Ghostbusters. They were like adults, not like the movies today where men are trying not to be adults. Um, So it's fascinating when she compares, but she's got all kinds Hmm. of great like trivia as well that I don't want to spoil because it was, there's some real fascinating stuff about Ghostbusters and when Harry met Sally even. And in some occasions, actually a lot of the chapters, she'll have interviewed someone either uh, a cast person from the show or, or uh, someone who wrote the movie um, dirty dancing. Mm-hmm. She spends a lot of time talking with the writer, which is fascinating. Cool. So I it highly sounds, recommend this. Book. It sounds really yeah, it good. Sound good. Oh, it's yeah. so good. And and the thing is that Hadley is funny because a lot of times when, with these sort of, you know, reflecting on movies, books, people think yeah. they're fun. Uh, authors think they're funny and they're only kind of funny. She's actually <laughs> funny. Like I found myself laughing out loud. So Highly recommend this this book that somehow just became I, I just became aware of it. It's called Life Moves Pretty Fast: The Lessons We Learned from Eighties Movies and Why We Don't Learn from Don't Learn Them from Movies Anymore by Hadley Freeman. Wow. Excellent. Okay, Brad, you're uh, okay. Bringing in the rear here. What do you got for us? I'm bringing it in. No, I'm I'm batting cleanup today. So. After a brief hiccup earlier today in which I tried to take Gail's book because I saw it sitting on my nightstand and thought, oh my gosh, that's the perfect book to talk about on this show. I have returned to another book that I've discussed a little bit on the podcast before, and that is The Speed of Sound, Breaking the Barriers Between Music and Technology by Thomas Dolby. So this is Dolby's memoir. It came out, I think, late 2016. And it's just, it's a lot of fun. He doesn't really pull any punches. And I think, you know, much like as you're describing uh, Richard Blade's book, he starts out kind of talking about his life when he was working in a shop that sold produce and, you know, just the hijinks he would get up to and how his first synthesizer was something that he pulled out of a garbage can behind a shop that sold synthesizers. Uh, you know, and took it back to his flat and started monkeying around with it, trying to get it to work. But I don't know if any of you have read this. I, I thought it was a lot of fun. Um, I have it. It I opens. Have it, he- I don't, haven't haven't started it yet. Crack it, brother. You'll like it. It opens with an anecdote about him trying to send Michael Jackson digital files over a payphone with his computer from his tour bus at some gas station in the middle of the desert in 1984. <laughs> it does not go well. Oh my god. <laughs> Like a picture how, like a, a, a paper clip, like in war games, you know? Yeah, right. yeah. That, that's how it opens. And he's like, I'm running out of quarters here and it won't work. But, you know, he's a good storyteller and he's had a really interesting career. He had a, I mean, he's had two really interesting careers. He had a, a, an amazing career as a musician. We're all familiar with that. But, you know, and it's, I think it's easy to forget how much kind of studio work he did. He talks a lot about working with Mutt Lang on Foreigner 4. And kind of the for him, how that was like kind of the kid in the candy shop moment for him because they just handed him a list and said, you know, tell us what equipment you want off of this list. We can have it here in an hour. Uh, you know, oh, and so he's like, oh, yeah, oh, I got, got that. It's one of those and give me one of those. And, you know, so that that's, that's pretty interesting. And I didn't realize at the time that he played uh, with David Bowie during Live Aid. Wow. 
So oh, he, I forgot about that. he's in Bowie's band on stage for Live Aid. And then, you know, he, he kind of falls victim to some, you know, music business silliness. The first half of the book kind of ends with him like, well, what am I going to do next? And then the second half of the book, he talks about his uh, career in Silicon Valley working with technology startups. The thing is, I knew that he made a, just a boatload of money something to do with ringtones and i just kind of kept waiting for it to happen in the book and it really it, it he holds it off to the very bitter end like it's the last kind of the last 20 pages of the book he finally gets around to the and then our software was installed in every headset sold in the world and i made more money than god which is basically what happened in the pre-smartphone era every phone by all of the major manufacturers had this software in it to play uh, ringtones and I, I don't know if you know this, but Thomas Dolby also wrote the Nokia default ringtone. No way. But, oh, wow. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, Jeez. He wrote that. Boy, that was ubiquitous. Yeah. Like, oh I don't know gosh, why no that kidding. fact makes me so happy. <laughs> <laughs> it's so yeah. cute. So now he goes on cruises with nerds like us, signs our books. Plays volleyball. Uh, and is, I think he's actually doing a tour this summer. It's like... Uh, smaller theaters it's like music and storytelling which would probably be fun be a great show i've seen him twice now it's yeah it's can't miss so we had our picks and a few weeks ago i asked fans on facebook to send us their picks for books either set in the 80s or books about the 80s we, we have two facebook accounts where we have several facebook accounts you can always friend me at steve spears but we there's also uh, a Sakinese Facebook account. So if you didn't know that, we post a lot of stuff there. So so don't forget to, to friend us on social media. But here are some of the suggestions that we got. Jeff Johnston, uh, our old friend Jeff in Cuba, recommends the Virgin uh, Encyclopedia of 80s Music. He said it was his go-to reference for his radio show in Cuba. So that's pretty good. A lot of recommendations mm -hmm. for American Psycho and Less Than Zero and Bonfire of the Vanities. Lots of those. You know, I think I've mentioned this on the show. I read Less Than Zero maybe a year or two ago for the first time, and I got to tell you, I found it very yeah. troubling. Well, it's Brad Easton Ellis. What do you expect? <laughs> he only knows yeah. one. Troubling is, what, troubling is his middle, is really his middle name. Randy Crone <laughs> said Shoeless Joe by W.P. Kinsella, which, by the way, of course, is the book that Field of Dreams is based off of. Lynette Simpson recommends Presumed Innocent by Scott Turo. And here's a good one. Tim Cook recommends uh, Rob Sheffield's books. He's he ha has some fantastic pieces of work. Two of our favorites: Talking to Girls About Duran Duran and Love Is a Mixtape. I have them both. Mm, both of those are I've yeah, read. They're fantastic. both really good. Douglas the General Arthur wanted to add a different perspective, so <laughs> he recommends Watchmen by Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons, saying that they changed the face of comics and uh, paved the way for the current movie craze about superheroes. I don't know if that's a good or bad thing. I'm about superheroed out. Christina Maloche. Maloche? Malaki? Anyone going to give that a try? I'm, I like Maloche. Maloche. Let's try that. It rhymes with Maloche. <laughs> exactly. Belloc. Belloc. Oh, it's Melloc. It's Christina Melloc. Melloc. <laughs> She's hating us right now. She recommends Sooner but or you Later. you have heard of us. <laughs> she recommends Sooner or Later which was written in 1978 and there was a movie in 1979, but she says all the girls read it in the eighties. Gail, Jen, either one of you recognize this title? Mm -mm. I recognize the movie cover. I don't recognize the, I don't didn't realize yeah. it was a book, I guess. I don't either. Uh, Steve Ramos or Ramirez, as I like to call him. Uh, Ramos. Ramos uh, recommends barbarians at the gate, the fall of RJR Namisco. That's a fantastic uh, book. Uh, I was surprised only one person recommended Motley Crue's The Dirt, and that was Tim Williams. Oh, that book is so fun. <laughs> it is so fun. It's crazy. I gave it to one of my friends. She She's a big hair metal fan, and she had a newborn baby in her house in Maine in the winter. And I was like, here, read this. And she <laughs> read it. And she, she was like, It'll save your life. Thank you so much. Yeah. I needed this. It's a fun book. Kirk Torster uh, said um, Mark Alley had uh, two excellent books that he loved. One was uh, I Was Geeky When Geeky Wasn't Cool and Don't Stop the Geeking. So might be, might be too much geek. Just a little too much geek. Yeah. Amy Albaran says uh, Finding John Hughes is her go-to. 
And then here's another one. I've read both these books. Kate Terry recommends two autobiographies by Duran Duran members. See, if, have either of you guys read these? In the Pleasure Group by John no. Taylor and Wild Boy, My Life in Duran Duran by Andy Taylor. So the John Taylor book has been sitting in my house for like four months and <laughs> I haven't read it yet. Is, do you recommend yes. it? Yes. Yes. And it is the okay. read. I assume oh, yeah. it'll be a quick read. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Okay. And I'm uh, bump that up the list. I read the Andy Taylor book back when it came out, which is about 10 years ago, right? Is a year or so after he left the band. Uh, maybe it was five years after he like left the it? band. I liked it a lot. And I interviewed him afterwards about the book. Huh. And he was a fantastic that, interview. Yeah. yeah, I have to go back and, gosh, that was back in the uh, BGF days. Don't make me go back and relive that. <laughs> <laughs> You don't have to listen to it. Just link to it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Flash bits. It's like Vietnam for me. Episode 143. One, 143. Gosh. We were just kids back then. We didn't need for hymns.com. <laughs> <laughs> just like that, they lost their sponsor. Base Note. Uh, our old friend Base Note says, uh, I want my MTV by Craig Marks and Ron Tannenbaum. Oh, that's a good one. That's fantastic. Co-sign. And the, yeah. the VJ book is also a great companion to that. They're both really good. Yeah, and I've got the VJ book sitting in my hand here, and this was awesome. This is the VJ, The Unplugged Adventures of MTV's First Wave, and it's like a uh, – one of those oral mm-hmm. histories and it just yeah. threads interviews with the four original VJs and it's awesome. Yeah. So highly yeah, recommend both that of those are- And they were signing them. They were signing them on the cruise, right? Mm-hmm. Or they yeah. do they still do that? But how many of us have one signed by all four of them? I do not. Mm-mm. I do I not. Do. It's because so you're there Steve you Spears. Nice. <laughs> That's all I've got going for me. God among yes. men. I'm going I'm to hold. <laughs> Which is good. Uh, Padre Paul recommends Red Storm Rising by Tom Clancy. All the Tom Clancy books are pretty good. And and here's a nice one. Gina Vivanetto. I don't yeah, everyone remember Gina Vivanetto. She was the yeah. original co host yeah. of Stuck in the 80s. She recommends Bright Lights, Big City by Jay McInerney. She says the book the movie was awful, but the book is a masterpiece. And I okay. have to agree with her. Stop right there. As we all know, this is the one movie that I've ever walked out of. <laughs> Actually I drove out. It was a drive in. <laughs> if Gina Vivanetto <laughs> recommends this book, I'm reading it. That's next. Yes. I, I was she all queued up to read The Boys in the Boat as soon as my wife finishes it, but I'm going to get Bright Lights Big City and read that instead. Yep. It's good. It's a good summer read, I think. Well, it's summer. Perfect. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> hey, can I add um, two more books sure. to this list? One is the um, the Phil Collins memoir, yeah, Not Dead Yet, that's really good. which I read last year, and I did it on audio, which I so highly recommend because it's narrated by Phil Collins oh, nice. himself, and that one was a great book. And then the other one is actually fiction, and it's a book that's set in the 80s, and it's called uh, Don't You Forget About Me by Jancy Dunn. And it's about this woman in her late 30s who goes, she like her husband tells her he wants a divorce, and she loses her job, and she moves back into her parents' house in New Jersey, and she's surrounded by all of her 80s posters and it's all about you know the clothes from the era and the music and she goes to her high school reunion and it's just it's light and funny and just filled with 80s details so i highly recommend i, I gotta throw one. one more in because I, I i assume we will eventually do a part two to this series but in, but in case we don't if, if we do i'm going to talk about this book much more but if we don't old records never die one man's quest for his vinyl past by eric spitznagel Hmm. absolutely one of the best books I've read in the last 10 years. And it's basically – Eric Spitzmanagel is this fantastic writer, a great interviewer, and he's he's basically mainly freelance, although every once in a while he'll, he'll tie his ship down to you know one port for a while. But he goes on a quest to find the original albums he owned when he was a kid, not just the titles, the actual album, like the, that very like – that cover, that very record. Huh. And it's just a fantastic um, story about getting old and the, the attachment of, to music that we have when we're young. Mm. I'm telling you, I read I read like two or three paragraphs of it a day, almost like I'm reading like the Bible or something because it's like I can, only, <laughs> I can only digest so much of it at once because it's just so good. What is it? Say the title again. Old Records Never Die, One Man's Quest for His Vinyl Past. 
So awesome. Oh. That sounds, I'm like making a list right now. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'll send you my copy, but uh, it's, it's after you so finish good. reading it, which will take seven no, years. No, no, no. I, I, I finished it. I finished it a, a few months ago, but I, I go back and still read like, I don't want to read that one chapter again about, you know, his kiss records, or I want to read about, you know, the, the journey escape album kind of thing. He's got stories about all these albums that we all have. We're connected to. Wow. I feel like I can't say more about it if we do another show, but I'm telling you, that's just one of the best ones we've seen. Save it for the show, Steve. Nice. Save it for the show. Hey, uh, speaking of amazing ways to spend the summer, uh, we here at Stuck in the 80s couldn't be happier to be working with HelloFresh again this year. HelloFresh is the meal kit delivery service that shops, plans, and delivers step-by-step recipes and ingredients right to your doorstep. I just got a new box of food this week, and the meals sound amazing. You know what I love the most? All my meals are made of fresh, responsibly obtained ingredients from carefully selected farms and highly rated sources. Both Brad and I are loyal HelloFresh customers, and for good reason. Yeah, for me, it's all about the enjoyment of not having to plan dinner. I can spend my time with my family and my terrible children who are slowly coming back to eat me out of house and home from college. (laughs) And I can relax knowing all the ingredients for dinner are right there in the refrigerator waiting for me. And the ingredients are pre-measured, so there's no waste. And the meals are almost always ready in 30 minutes or less. Last night, I made the Cuban spice steak with poblano peppers, and it came with this amazing cream sauce that I made from scratch. Just incredible. That's really the key that we always forget to talk about. HelloFresh gets you out of that recipe rut and encourages you to cook meals that you might feel are outside your comfort zone. Yeah, but once you see how easy it is, you realize that it's right in your comfort zone. And because you're a listener to Stuck in the 80s, you get a special deal. Save $30 off your first order of HelloFresh by going to HelloFresh.com slash Radical30. The new URL is HelloFresh.com slash Radical30 and then use the promo code Radical30. There's a lot of Radical in there, but don't worry. I know you can handle it. And if you do it, you'll be helping out the podcast and you'll be helping out your family. You know what else helps us out each week at this point in the show? The Seggies? No, a trivia challenge. Shall we play a game? Yay, that's right. I'm so excited for this one. Shall we play a game? We shall. Yes. We shall. Love to. Yes, love to. Yes, love to. So this game is a little bit related to our subject matter tonight. So we did... Summer reading, right? Because it's it's the summer. But what happens before you graduate? What do you have to do? Oh, no. Take the SATs. So this game is oh, called <laughs> SAT80s. There are four sections, but don't worry. They'll go quickly. There's only a few, few questions, four or five in each one. Math, English. I thought they got rid of the writing assignment one. This is SAT80s. So. Oh, yes, yes, gotcha. You'll see. All right, so um, do you guys want to practice ringing in? Steve. Rap. Gail. All right. You get points just for saying that, just like on the real SATs. <laughs> <laughs> See? See are, do, we, do we lose points for guessing? No. So it's more like the ACT. Okay. That's the one I took oh, because there point. was more writing in it. Here we go. <laughs> Section one is, as related to our, our topic this week, reading. Question one. Which of these Stephen King books was not made into a major motion picture in the 80s? Christine, Cujo, The Stand, or Firestarter? Brad. Steve. Brad. The Stand. That is correct. TV miniseries in 1994. The rest were, of course, movies in the 80s that you watched at slumber parties. All right. (laughs) Question number two. I remember putting Cujo up on the on the uh, marquee at the Vesta in Weatherford, so I saw that one in the theater. Ooh, um, lots of times, probably, right? Yeah, in, in, in ten minute chunks when I could sneak into the theater, but that's a whole other story. Sorry. Yeah, they're in the car a lot. Okay, question number two. Name two other books by the Outsiders author S. E. Hinton. Mm. Ah. <sighs> I've got one, maybe. Anyone want to ring in and give it a shot? No. Can I give my one? Yeah. Go for it. Is it called Rumblefish? It is called Rumblefish. Should Gail get half a point? What do we think? Oh, I didn't I didn't know that she wrote Rumblefish. That's awesome. Yeah, she's Rumble? definitely getting half a point. Of course. Okay. Rumblefish text. Full credit. That was then, this is now. Ah. Uh, I didn't know that one at all. Question three. What year did Alice Walker receive the Pulitzer Prize for fiction for her novel, The Color Purple? Steve. Steve. 1996. The name of the 
game is well, I just- SAT. <laughs> Gail. Gail. 1987? Mm. Nope. Brad, want to take a shot? Brad, uh, 1986. 1983 is the answer. Oh, took a long time to make that one into a movie. Not even close. (laughs) Question four. Which of these titles is not the name of a novel by author Sidney Sheldon? Windmills of the Gods. (laughs) If Tomorrow Comes. Walk Swiftly, Speak Slowly. Or Rage of Angels. Brad. Brad. Walk Swiftly, Speak Slowly. (laughs) I couldn't say that with a straight face. (laughs) Brad gets the point. (laughs) Guesswork. Yes. Very good. And of course it was C. I don't know if you know. It's always C. 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 Question five. This is the last one of the reading section. What are the names of the twins in the Sweet Valley series? And I, if you know it already, I, or I can give you choices. Gail. (laughs) Elizabeth and Jessica. Nice. Gail gets a point. Come on. (laughs) Can I tell you what my uh, options were? <laughs> Jessica and Elizabeth Wakefield, Jean and Liz Sagel, or Kate and Allison Foster? Oh. Oh, I would have picked that last one. <laughs> I, would, I could have even said Wakefield. I didn't know you wanted last name. Too. Yeah, no, I knew you knew it. I knew you knew it. I even read the, um, you know, like two years ago, there was a, um, they like revisited them now. They wrote a, a yeah. like a bring them up to the present day. And I read that. You read the Cobra Kai of Sweet Valley? Yes, I read that the Cobra Kai nice. Valley, and it was exactly what you would have expected. <laughs> <laughs> Which could be good or bad, depending on what you're expecting. Right, again. exactly. Yes. Awesome. Yes. All right, section two, math. Ugh. All right, listen carefully. Question one. How many members of Duran Duran were in the original lineup, the power station, and Arcadia? Wait, is that three different answers, or is that like what... What of those people were in all of... I don't, I don't understand yes, the question. exactly right. How many members of Duran Duran were in the original lineup, the power station, and also Arcadia? I need a number. Steve. Steve. It's yes. just one number, right? Three. Anyone else want to take a stab at it? Because that is not correct. Brad. Brad. Two. Gail. Um, <laughs> four. <laughs> the answer is zero. Oh, no overlap. There was no overlap, which was surprising to me, but the answer was zero. Okay, math is hard, guys. Math is hard. (laughs) Here we go. Question two. Which of these 1980s movie franchises had the fewest number of sequels? Mm. Back (laughs) to the Future, Revenge of the Nerds, or Police Academy? Steve. Steve. It's Back to the Future. It is Back to the Future. There were only three of those. There were four of Revenge of the Nerds, including some TV <laughs> movies in the 90s. Uh, so Police bad. Academy, six. And here's the best yeah. part. All six of them were made in the 80s. <laughs> oh my That's God. crazy. Yeah, 1989 was the last one. City Under Siege. Cranking them out. All right. Question three. How many weeks was MJ's Thriller the number one album <sighs> in the land? And I'm going to give you some options. 35 weeks, 37 Forty-five or forty-seven weeks. Oh, jeez. Yes, Steve? Steve. Whatever the thirty number was. <laughs> there were two. <laughs> <laughs> I like them both, please. <laughs> Brad, over there. Forty-five. Brad, you've narrowed it down. Yes, Brad. Forty-seven. Thirty-seven weeks. Wow. No points for that one. Thirty-seven. Uh. Weeks. All right, we're, we're close to the end of this section. What company followed up their hit educational toy, Speak and Spell, with Speak and Math? Oh, gosh. Steve? Steve. Hasbro? Nope. Brad. Brad. Is it play school? Nope. Gail, want to give uh, me a No, shoot. I know what it is. Can I have another guess? Or go, go ahead. I don't know. You take it, Steve. The, is it Fisher Price? The answer, guys, you're going to kick yourselves Texas Instruments. Ooh. Yes, it was. Uh, I'm thinking about kicking someone, but it's not me. All right. <laughs> Here is the last question. <laughs> Some people did not study for their SAT 80s, I think. Okay, here we go. How many left balloons? Steve. Brad. Steve. 99. Very good. You get that point, Steve. Congratulations. <laughs> Jesus point. That's it. I'm... <laughs> All right. Section three, history. Question one, where did the U.S. Olympic hockey team defeat the Soviet Union in the 70s? That was Lake Placid. 
one point for Steve. Number two, who were the presidential and vice presidential candidates in 1984? So I'm going to need four names. 84. Steve. Gail. I heard Steve. Okay, so it would have been um, Reagan and Bush, and then it would have been um, Mondale and Ferrara. Very good. Point for Steve. Question three. Which of these things were not invented in the 1980s? The artificial human heart, the camcorder, the floppy disk, or the Nintendo Game Boy? Gail. Gail. The artificial heart. Mm. Nope. Steve. Brad. 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 Camcorder. Nope. Steve. Steve. I'm going to go with the floppy disk. The floppy disk was 1971. Yeah. Question number four, last one in this round. The, on New Year's Eve... 1989, what celebrity became an unlikely symbol of democracy as he sang the song Looking for Freedom from the top of the Berlin Wall? Brad. Brad. Half a off. <laughs> yeah. It is correct. Oh my god. And it was very foggy that night, was it not, yes. Steve? Very, very foggy. foggy. All right, so going into the next section, Steve has five, Brad has three, Gail has one and a half. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that man. could put you over the top. You don't know. No, no, no. All right. Now, this is the final section. It is analogies. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Number one. Elise Keaton is to Stephen Keaton as Maggie Seaver is to... Steve. Steve. The Tom Seaver? Nope. I know. That's why oh, I, 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 it, was, it was in my head. I'm just like, I got to spit it out. I don't know his name. Come on, guess. Brad. Brad, the TV watcher? Yeah, I got nothing. <laughs> Pass. Jason ah, Seaver. Son of a... All right, number two. Prince Charles is to Diana Spencer as Prince Andrew is to... Gail. Gail. Fergie? Yeah. Fergie! Sarah Ferguson? The real Fergie, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the original <laughs> Fergie. The original <laughs> Fergie. Oh, F. Question three. After MASH is to MASH as the Tortellis is to... Gail. Gail. Cheers. Oh, Cheers. That's good Correct. One. Wow. That's hard. All right. Now, that's this hard. is the final question. Clyde is to Pac-Man as Mario is to... Gail. Steve? I heard it was close. I'm going to say Gail. Donkey Kong? Donkey Kong is correct. That's just, you would have gotten it right anyway. I, didn't get, I wouldn't have said that, so that's good. Yeah. Okay. So this is great. This is the end of the game. I mean, the test. <laughs> <laughs> and let's see. Brad, you have three. Gail, you have four and a half. Steve, you have five. Oh, oh wow. wow. Nice. Very close. You know what, you know what they Very say? Close. Looks like University of Illinois. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> oh, my God. I can't believe I won that one. That's that's bizarre. Um, it wasn't looking good for you at the beginning, but no, you pulled it out. Well, some of the Mondale Ferrara question was one of the trivia questions one year on the boat. So that was still fresh in my head. Ah. And then we just had the Lake Placid anniversary again. So that was still in my head. So that's the, I kind of yeah. I lucked out. You on beat me to that one. You beat me to that one. Yeah, I mean, I had just, that one. I knew that one. The, um, anyway. Okay, so, Ross, so, Ross, so what was the tiebreaker? What was the tiebreaker? Well, you know, I have written on my, my document here tiebreaker and then nothing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, I'm symbolic. really glad. <laughs> There wasn't a tie. Yeah, I have no idea what I was thinking there. I, I think I had an idea, and then it just went away. I think if away. there were the trophy to give away, though, I would give it to Gail because I mean, you know, she got answers to questions that I wasn't even in my brain. So just you know, you you really impressed me. That was those were fantastic. So. Aww. Great question. As always, we encourage everyone um, go check out Gail's blog. It's every day I write the book blog dot com. We will put all the links to the books that we mentioned during our podcast onto uh, sit80s.com, not sat80s.com, sit80s.com. So look for them there. If you like the show, let us know, and we will start planning part two, maybe for the fall reading list. But in the meantime, Jen and Gail, thank you so much. It's so great when the four of us are, are all together. Thank you so much for having me back. Yeah, it's fun. I like talking about books. Isn't it yes. fun? Shouldn't we do another show? Yes. <laughs> Great. I think there's enough material there. I just want to talk about old records never dying some more. <laughs> so anyway, and read out of it like it's the Bible. On the third day, Spitznagel said, his records shall rule the day. Hey, in the meantime, we remain here with our books and our friends, hopelessly stuck in the 80s. 
Stuck in the 80s is a member of the CLNS Media Network. Special thanks to Check Battery Daily for our theme music. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or the CLNS Media mobile app.